So just to recap, uh, in the first activity, all of you went down together to the GB lobby um, using the shortest route, following one of the counselors. Um, and you came back in two and a half minutes. In the second activity, you split into two different routes. One was a bit shorter, one was a bit longer. Uh, and you came back in, although you were tired, you came back in two minutes and seven seconds. Uh, one of the things that we noticed in activity one was uh, people who were faster had to slow down because they were people who were slower than them, ahead of them. And there was a lot of speeding up and slowing down, speeding up and slowing down, right? There was a lot of density of people in, uh, ahead of you. So, um, that, no, that's the same one. Okay. Now, if someone, what, uh, if all of you didn't know the building and were, all, uh, were told that was the only way, so the first road, right? What would have happened? What happened in the first one? Uh, all of you would have been slower together. Um, however, knowing different um, roads or knowledge of the area that you are in gives you other options. That's why, for example, in, in Paramix, we have a percentage of people who know the area and a percentage of people who don't know the area. That's why they might go to longer routes than they're supposed to. Okay? That is taken into account because um, if you go to particular places where you have lots of uh, tourists, uh, example, Florida, a lot of the drivers all around the year are not actually familiar with the roads there, right? So you expect things to not be ha happening uh, in the most efficient way, and people have, uh, there have to be more careful because you have lots of visitors who don't know the area well regarding driving, regarding the roads. Uh, the ones who know, of course, will go to the alternate routes, which could be faster. Okay. Now, uh, the other thing is selfish driving, uh, usually through the shortest route, does not always lead to the best outcome. If there isn't enough traffic on the road, the shortest route is going to be the fastest route. However, if there, there are lots of people on the road, then the shortest route might be even slower than the other ones. Um, so now we're going to start tying these into the theory. There's a lot of, um, I would say, physics and math in here. Please stop me at any time. There are lots of um, interesting uh, things, but things that are um, not very easy. So please stop me. In the afternoon, you have individual activities where you're solving things. OK? So uh, math. It's two equations to unknown, three equations to unknown, things like that, regarding transportation. So please make sure you're understanding uh, the material here. OK. Um, first of all, this is an analogy between roads and rivers. Um, traffic flow, the flow of vehicles, is like flow of water um, in a river. You have, if you have more water for, uh, coming from upstream, the water level rises. And if there's an obstruction downstream, water level rises. Now, eventually, what would happen is, in the last picture here, you have an overflow of water, and it spreads across the land, uh, where it shouldn't be, right? So imagine if you have too many vehicles, then you might have collisions, and they could go to the land. Well, that's, uh, that doesn't usually happen, but you know what I mean. Uh, this is the macroscopic uh, way of modeling things, and we'll, we'll cover these things in, in detail um, later. OK, now let's go to the details of what we have here. What are the different parameters? One of the notions we mentioned was density. OK, feel free to take notes um, if, you want, if you can't remember things. So density um, is, OK, you can see this. Uh, cross section of the road here. So this is a road segment, and dx is a small cr cross section of the road. In, within that area, uh, you have um, number of vehicles per kilometer. So the unit is vehicles per kilometer for density. Okay, um, and at different times you have different densities within that particular section. That's why uh, it's uh, rho 
xt. So it depends on, diff on two different elements. It depends on what time you're looking at, what time step you're looking at, whether you're looking now or five seconds from now or five minutes from now. Um, and x, which means the location where you are at, okay? The exact um, location on the road segment that you're looking at. Okay, so that's density. Questions? Okay. Now, so this is a space variable over a section. Next, we go to speed. Speed also depends um, on what section you are in, and it depends when you're measuring it. If you're measuring it during the morning, um, uh, morning rush hour when everyone is going to work, speeds are going to be lower, right? Because there's more vehicles on the road, so speeds are going to be lower. Um, and this, for, for measuring speed, you have, one way you can do that is you capture a vehicle at the beginning, you capture a vehicle at the end, and then you see how much time it took, and then you divide it by distance. distance. What are, what's the unit for distance? Meters. Unit for uh, distance is meters. What's the unit for speed? Meters per second. So speed is distance by time. Okay, so this is, uh, I guess, grade, I can't remember what year. Uh, it's physics, grade maybe 10 or grade 11 physics, uh, or maybe even before. Um, okay, so it could be meters per second, and then you, you can convert it. You can convert it to kilometers per hour also. Um, let's see. Next, you have this measure, which we're not... Uh, used to, in general, this is not as intuitive. It's called traffic volume. Uh, traffic volume, another notion, for, another name for it is flow, traffic flow. When you say it's flowing well, what do we mean by that? Um, so this means, um, just back. thanks. This is the number of vehicles per time unit. So vehicles per hour. For this, uh, for uh, Q, what you need to look at is a point. So you can see this line. You're looking at that point. Uh, you, you, what you can imagine is you have this road segment and you're standing um, on the side of the road and you're looking at a point and you're counting how many vehicles are going through every second or every hour or every minute. Okay? So flow or volume is the number of vehicles per time unit that cross a particular point. Okay, it's not how many are passing in an hour. You have to divide it by the time and you see how many are passing in a particular time. Yes? Wait, so you're saying that, that either indicates a good or bad flow? Uh, what indicates good or bad flow? If, if, it's, if, it's, if it's a higher number, then it's higher. Yes, if it's a higher number, then it means... Um, We'll see in detail that uh, the flow is not as intuitive. It has different meanings. Uh, it means things are going well in general, yes. I'm, uh, 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 roads have been designed uh, with a particular capacity, with a, uh, uh, being able to let a certain number of vehicles go through. And if your flow is high, it means you're using your road efficiently. Um, OK, so how are these three li related? Look at the units. Give me a formula, please. All of them depend on X and T, yes. But how are these three related? Over? So mean speed uh, is equal to traffic density, so vehicular. Um, let, let's, let's put it here. So you're saying, let's take the units. Kilometers per hour equal, you said traffic density? Traffic volume is correct. OK? Now we can look at this in an uh, so kilometer per hour, and then you get kilometer per hour. So the units are correct. Um, okay, here, let me show it. Uh, 
OK, let me just explain this first. Now, if you, if you look, uh, if you divide your space into small, uh, smaller pieces and if you divide your time, so you're looking at second 0, second 1, second 2, second 3, second 4, um, then you can see, you can, um, the way you can count this is, in my section 1, I had a particular density and a particular uh, flow. In my section 2, what I'm going to have is related to what, what I had in section 1, right? So if I have a set of vehicles that left section 2 going to section 3, then my density decreased. But at the same time, it depends how many vehicles I have here. If I have a large number of vehicles entering from here, then it will, um, then my density will go back high again. Um, so that is how you can do this. Uh, you can uh, use this, this type of model uh, to, uh, to represent traffic flow as if, um, such as the water flow in a river as we explained earlier. So let's see. Um, here, if you, if, you uh, if you represent time with small instances, uh, anything from 0 0.2 to 15 seconds, and then um, what you need to make, make sure of is your um, sections have to, big and big, have to be big enough such that no vehicle can jump through sections. So every vehicle can either stay in their own section or pass to the next section. Okay? That depends on the small time that you have. So within that small time, and no vehicle can jump to, uh, across two, two of these sections. OK. Um, now let's go to the formula. So this is one way of remembering it. Q is equal to KU. OK? Q equal Q. Q is, um, uh, Q is uh, let's see. Let's go back. Here I have different notations. K is density. K or rho are, are density. Maybe you should write these down. So K or rho are density, and the unit is vehicle um, number of vehicles per kilometer. Uh, U or V is mean speed. Okay, um, and Q is traffic volume. Okay, or the flow. So for each one, there are like two different names and two different notions. So volume is volume or flow is Q. And speed is v or u, and density is rho or q. Let's try to stick to q and ku. Um, yeah, I have two different notations here. Okay. So q is equal to rho v or q is equal to ku. It, what that means is the. Let's go back in here to understand this. I have a particular section, and uh, within that, within that section, within that um, distance, basically, I have a particular density. I have a density of cars. Let's say I have 100 vehicles here. Another thing that I have is the, the speed in that uh, section. So I have 100 vehicles, and they're going by at this speed. If I multiply those things together, what do I get? How many vehicles are going through? Right? So let's think of this again. We said that density depends on, uh, the, the density is a measure of the particular section that I have, and I have a measure of the speed of the vehicles in, within that section, the average speed of the vehicles in that section. Um, and density is um, vehicles per kilometer, and speed is kilometers per hour. So I have this many vehicles per kilometer, and they're going by um, with a particular speed of kilometers uh, per, per hour. So if I multiply them, what I end up with is how many vehicles are going through my section. Okay? I get the flash here because remember what we said about flow? Flow is at a point. I'm seeing how many vehicles are going through. And you keep doing that. That Q comes into here and increases the, um, the density, and then based on that, you, do, you run this over time, over different small periods here, and you get uh, a very accurate model of what has happened. As long as, again, the t is short enough that no vehicle can pass two cross-sections um, within one 
uh, instance. Okay, questions up to here. These three uh, parameters, these three road parameters, are the most important parameters in uh, transportation. If you don't understand them, you won't understand anything after this. If you have questions, please, please, please ask me. Okay, let's have an exercise then. Let's make sure people are getting this. Uh, I'm going to erase this. And I'm going to ask someone to come up and draw graphs for me. Who likes graphs? Felipe is going to, draw, going to be drawing there, and other people are going to be helping him. So you know what a graph is? OK. <laughs> uh, just making sure. Uh, so why don't you draw like an, an x, y? OK? So on your, on your x, uh, instead of your x, let's put um, density. OK? And on your y, let's put speed. OK? So density, we represented it with k. Let's, let's use k. Um, no, it's, a, it's, it's called k, and the measure is the unit. Uh, we, in brackets, we put the unit. So it's, uh, what's the unit of density? Someone help him out? What is it? Um, vehicles per kilometer, yes. And what's the unit of speed? Is speed represented with V or U, please? How does speed change with density? More density, less speed? More density, less speed. Does everyone agree? OK. How is the graph going to look? Look at what Raul is telling you. Why didn't it go to 0? Does it, go, does, does it reach 0? I'm asking you. I don't know. Does it reach 0? What if, the, what if the road is packed and vehicles are not moving? It could actually like, be very close to zero, but this is an accurate representation. Now, I'm, I'm wondering why the um, density wasn't zero there. So at the beginning, this is not touching here. Can the density be zero? Sunday night at, I don't know, 4 AM. Exactly, exactly. So we're going to see um, the basic model is similar to this. And there's another model which has a bit of a curve, uh, but it has the same um, direction. OK, thanks a lot. Please, uh, let's thank our colleague. OK, now the more difficult stuff. Who wants to go next? Who wants to go next? OK, let's see. Um, it's a similar graph. Let's think of the x-axis and the y-axis. Should I draw this thing? Yeah, so draw it under it, please. Yeah. Um, the density and flow is a bit difficult. Let's do, let's do density, again, on the, on the x-axis. OK, and then let's do, can people see there? Yeah? Um, and on the y-axis, let's do flow. So flow is um, Q. Q, and the unit is um, vehicles per hour. Remember, flow is representing how many vehicles are going through a, a particular point. So what is going to happen here? Explain why. Your colleague here is saying it's like going to look like a parabola, and you, you did something like this. Why, why is it going to look that way? Explain. So what your colleague is saying is when you have a small density, then you can have, uh, you're not going to have too many vehicles going through, right? Because you don't have that many vehicles. So if you're looking at one point, you can have 
you can't have that many vehicles going through. Then if you look towards the other side, so going right, uh, with very high densities, what's going to happen again is they're all going to be slow, right? So uh, you won't be able to have that many vehicles going through. Remember what we were saying before about density and speed, and then based on those, uh, you'd, decide, you'd figure out how many vehicles end up going through to the next sex section. So that's what we're trying to figure out. So he's saying that at very high densities, again, it's very low. And, but somewhere in the middle, when I don't have too many vehicles, then I can use a lot of my, uh, then a lot of vehicles would be going through. That's why my flow would be high. Um, so do you understand how you're supposed to draw the graph? OK, so does everyone know what a parabola is? Yeah? OK, so what is happening here at the, at the beginning is that you don't have enough vehicles, so flow is uh, small. And at the end, again, you have the same thing. And somewhere around the middle, you, can, um, you don't have too many vehicles, so you don't have lots of stop and go traffic. But uh, that, that's why you can use your uh, capacity really well and have a large flow. That is what happened in activity two. You didn't have too many people slowing you down, except for the cross country uh, runner there, uh, for whom everyone's slow. But for the rest of the of the students, uh, you didn't have too much traffic. That's why you you were able to go uh, to go uh, fast. Now let's think about the end. So, can we have zero flow? So if, if the density is really high, can we have zero flow? It could be very close, right? If all the vehicles are stopped, um, then the, at the end, it could actually be very close to zero. What about at the beginning? At the beginning, it could definitely be zero. So you can take that down to the origin on the left-hand side. OK, if you don't have co cars coming in, then, um, then the flow could be zero. OK, um, any questions about this? Is this clear to everyone? OK, let's thank our colleague. OK, now the last graph, not the easiest one. OK, so what you're going to have on the uh, on the x-axis is flow. You're going to have Q, and the unit is vehicles per hour. And on the y-axis, you're going to have speed. So uh, the unit is kilometers per hour, right? OK. So what are we going to have here? A downward curve. So if, OK, let's see. So if flow is higher than your speed is lower, not necessarily. If your flow is higher, it means things are usually going well. So things are, are not going to be slowing down could be the other way around, actually, but not exactly that. OK, any other ideas? Yeah. A straight line up. Uh, so straight line up, that, what that says is when the flow is increasing, then things are going uh, fast. Now, what if? So wh wh why don't you leave that? Why don't you leave that on for a second, the, the one that you had drawn? You're going up, going up. OK, so uh, put a point at the beginning of that curve somewhere. Yeah. So if you look at one of uh, a point at the beginning, then what we are saying there is if the flow is low, you don't have that many vehicles going through, then the speed has to be low, right? If you have one car on the road, the flow is low. 
but speed could be high, okay? So starting with this graph, how can you change it? What can you add here? To Which way around? That way? Not this one. No, this is wrong. Sideways. Which way sideways? So start with the, start with the um, curve going up. No, no, the regular one. Yeah. And then continue that as a parabola going left. Try, let's take every point. So uh, could you highlight the point at the top, the, the, fast, the last point? What does this represent? What does this represent? Low vehicles, low, l small number of vehicles on the road, so high speed. Is this correct? OK. What about the point at the bottom? Too many vehicles. Too many vehicles. When you have too many vehicles, then your flow is small and your speed is small. You're not getting many vehicles across a point, and your speed is small because there's so much, it, uh, it's so busy ahead of you. Yes? You don't. You, this, is, this is a valid graph. So, uh, no, no, no. Here's the thing. Here's the thing. That's why you have three different graphs. Okay? Remember the units? Now, if you represent this the other way around, the graph would look differently. So the first graph will look different. And then when you multiply them, you get that. Remember that. Uh, Let's see, which one was it? Q equal, um, Q equal KU. So actually, these three graphs, they can be put together in a 3D graph. It's, uh, I've seen it a couple of times. It's nice, but it's very hard to understand. This is easier. Uh, but remember that these three are, are connected together. That's why you have, we're representing them two by two, but you can actually represent the three of them together. Yes? Mm -hmm. Yes. Well, that's why it's high. That's why it's not going in. Like, like this one, yes. which uh, is also represented there. Speed. Any instance now, we can show it on the three different graphs. Yeah. So I was thinking it might be a plateau first, because if you have a certain number It of is a plateau there. So the, the, uh, that one, yeah. this one is going to come here to a plateau. As I'm talking about that graph. Yes. But I was explaining this okay. earlier, because you can't have uh, absolutely high speed, yes. OK, so let's, yeah. Um, you said that the number of vehicles is high, the speed is high? This is not density. Q is the number of vehicles going through. OK, so in here, this point is equivalent to this point. OK, at that point, what you have is not too little vehicles and not too many vehicles. You have the right amount of vehicles that you can get them across. Get them across means high, um, high flow. Okay? So you can uh, look at this graph in two ways. Start with the speed. Okay? If, you have, uh, if you have a low speed, right? If you have a low speed, we are here, then you have to come to the flow. If you have a low speed, then you have to have a small flow, right? Now, if you have um, a good speed, like rel relatively good, close to the, um, let's see, uh, less, than the, your, um, less than your speed limit, then that means um, that means you have a decent amount of vehicles, so you're around here, and you're getting lots of vehicles through. If, you, if your vehicles are going through at free flow speed, they're going too fast. What does that mean? There aren't enough vehicles on the road. That means that you are here. That means that you are here. Okay. That means that your density is low. That's why 
uh, things are doing fine, but you have only a small number of vehicles. That's like, again, 4 a.m. on a Sunday morning uh, or Monday morning. That's why your flow, your usage of the road is low. Okay? Now I have the graphs here. Let's thank our colleague. Okay. So I have them represented here. Um, let's see. Again, um, first of all, we had the density versus speed curve. And you can see there's one with a line and there's one which is curved. The curved is a bit more accurate. Um, if you look at uh, it's, it's, it has to be curved, and you write at the top of the curve, this becomes a plateau, okay? Because uh, unless you don't have a limit, a speed limit on your highway. Uh, in North America, uh, we have speed limits. In Germany, in the autobahns, you don't. So that could be high. Um, so if you, look at the, if you look at that one, which we did here, you can see that if the density is very small, then you're not getting across uh, many vehicles. That's why your flow is low. When your density is the optimal density, then you're getting across the maximum number of vehicles. When your density increases further, what you start having is congestion. Okay? So the left of this is uncongested state. The right of this is congested state. When you have uncongested state, things are going well, things are going pretty well. People are not slowing down each other much. Um, when you start going into congested speed, that's when you start waiting for people because they're ahead of you and they're slower and you can't cross them. You have a limited number of lanes. Okay? If all the roads had, I don't know, 20 lanes, you might not have congestion issues because people, faster people would be going through. They wouldn't wait for uh, slower uh, drivers. Um, but capacity uh, is, is limited and you can't it's going to cost a lot to build 20 lane highways okay so left of this is uncongested right of this is congested and at the end here this kj is called the jam density that is where speed uh, that, that is where flow will go down to almost zero so things are not going through basically it's a parking lot it's not a road anymore okay you can Think of that. Uh, and uh, how many of you live in Toronto? A few of you. Has anyone heard the nickname for the DVP? So it, uh, DVP is a highway uh, which is on the east side going downtown. Uh, it stands for Don Valley Parkway. A lot of people call it Don Valley Par Parking Lot. Uh, it, uh, it has three lanes on each side, which is uh, pretty small. And uh, because the downtown has grown um, quite a lot, and these highways have been there for quite some time, um, it's always busy, uh, especially during um, like afternoon rush hour. It might take people an hour and a half uh, or an hour to get out of the downtown area. Um, OK, let's see. Here, if you go to this graph, again, you have this middle point. Okay? You have the speed that the vehicles would be going at, um, V0, v or uh, the optimal uh, one. That is when uh, you have the maximum flow, right? The maximum flow is here. Okay? When you have the maximum flow, your speed is not free flow speed. Your speed is less than free flow speed. Why? Because if you're going at free flow speed, that means that there aren't many vehicles. OK? Um, there aren't that many vehicles. That's why your flow, uh, your, your flow is, is less. Um, because if you do the intersection here, the flow will be a lower value. OK. Um, again, you have the same points here. So you have the KO and the VO. And you have the same scenarios of uncongested and congested. So this is the congested part when density becomes high. This is congested part. This is uncongested. And in here, uh, the upper part is uncongested and the lower part is congested. Again, remember then when you multiply these uh, graphs, um, you have k equal qu. 
And these three um, things, you can put them together on a 3D graph. So this circular part has to come this way in order to match things. And the other uh, line has to come this way on top in order for you to have the 3D graph. Um, OK, questions? It is very, very, very important that you understand the, um, these three graphs. These are the fundamental um, diagrams of traffic flow theory. And the first time I saw this parabola, and I was like, what the heck is happening here? So some of your reactions were similar. Questions? Yes. It would shift your curve. It might expand it or shrink it. So your speed, if, you're, uh, if your speeds are improving, you might get a wider, wider curve there, right? You'll, you'll be getting a higher speed. Um, or it might shift the uncongested and congested state to the left or right. If things are improving, then your uncongested state is going to be bigger. If things are getting worse, the congested state is gonna, going to be bigger. Um, but the overall shape has to, have, has to look the same. It could be wider or smaller or upward or going up or down, but the overall shape has to be the same. Um, OK, so let's, uh, the, let's see, do I have, uh, let me see. No. I think I have that later. But let, let me ask you this. So why does this go down? Why does this not stay up? Yeah. Sorry? Human error. Human error is, is one. Yes. OK. Let's go back to the activity that you had today in the morning. What was the reason um, why you slowed down? What, so that to prevent what? to prevent crashing, right? So in other engineering systems where you can, uh, where you have a particular capacity, you keep flowing stuff to go through. And when, when, you, when you reach capacity, um, no matter what you add, you can still use up up to capacity, right? So this thing doesn't go down. One example for that is the conveyor belt example. So at the beginning, the number of items that are going through on a conveyor belt are low. When I keep increasing stuff, then you will have at least the, the maximum capacity. It will not go down, right? So I'm loading stuff onto the conveyor belt. It reaches a particular capacity and stays there. Here, what happens after, um, after that optimal density is that people start going slower because they want to avoid accidents. The, how, um, how people drive have different patterns, different speeds. That's why you need to keep that distance. That is really important. The distances between the vehicles um, change, uh, and you adjust to that, and you slow down based on that distance, and then someone else slows down based on the distance behind you. That's why this starts going down. The busier it gets, because humans are, are doing this, are, the, are doing the driving, it's not fully automated. Um, that's why people will start driving slowly. OK, so remember, efficiency versus, um, efficiency versus safety. So efficiency starts going down because they want to have their safety insured. And that's why this starts going down. Because you can't be driving at 100 kilometers per hour when it's really congested, right? You'll be crashing. Yes. So with, with driving rules, um, you are supposed to keep uh, two seconds of, um, I think they call two seconds of headway in front of you. So the distance uh, between you and the vehicle in front of you should be equivalent to your uh, speed times uh, two seconds. It might even be three seconds, depending on whether it's a bike in front of you um, or a smaller vehicle. Um, so th that distance, uh, that minimum distance, needs to ensure that you're going to be able to stop in time and be without crashing. So when, when you're driving at a very, very high speed, the distances between the vehicles 
would increase, right? You have to have bigger distances between the vehicles for safety, and that reduces how many vehicles you're actually, uh, you could get through the system. That's why your flow goes down. Uh, if you imagine something in the future where everything is going through, let's say, I don't know, uh, on tracks, all the vehicles are going on tracks and you're not the actual person driving, the vehicles are being dr driven by themselves, then you can be going at 100K and have two inches between every two cars, right? Then the capacity that you'd be using out of the road will be maximum. You're, it's even going to be shifted, right? So that's when you take out the human out of it, but there are lots of the, uh, issues with that with autonomous vehicles um, and so on. Okay, any other questions on this? Yes. Um, what would be the problems? One of the common uh, issues now is um, insurance. So currently you are the one driving, even if you're using navigation systems, you're being given different routes. You have the option of which route to follow. Um, if the route that you took is slower than what the, another route would have, uh, would have been, you can't sue anyone because you're being given multiple routes. However, um, if with autonomous vehicles, you're not the one driving, Espe especially if uh, the way you, uh, you, uh, things uh, could be in the future. The notion is you won't be driving. A machine would be driving. A, a computer would be driving. What if there's an accident? Okay, so not all the vehicles are going to be autonomous at the beginning. There's human error somewhere, and the person stopped, and you crashed to that vehicle. And you're, you're inside a vehicle that you're not driving. Is the insurance going to cover it? You, you, what you would be saying is, I wasn't the one driving. Who are you going to sue? You're going to sue the car manufacturer company? You're going to sue the person who wrote the algorithm? Like, uh, are you going to sue Google because they put the technology in that car? That's that's the thing. Not everyone can afford changing all the vehicles at the same time. It has to go through particular stages of market deployment, and it's going to take time. And uh, what are you going to do with all the insurance companies? They're going to go on strike. They're, they're, they're going to lose their jobs. You're not, if you're not going to have accidents anymore, <laughs> right? So there are lots of deals with that. And uh, a lot of these things have to do with policy. And policy usually goes uh, like slowly. You have to make sure everything is right. Everything has to be 150% like, safe. Because you're sitting in a vehicle. You're not touching anything. You're going 100, 120, 140K. Right? You want to make sure that that algorithm is safe. You know what I mean? No matter how many radars and stuff you have, LIDARs and the systems you have on top of you. Yes? Well, it is, it is, uh, there are too many uh, things, too many stakeholders. Some want it, some don't want it. Um, but there are like legal issues. And the, uh, basically, in, um, in smart transportation, the, uh, what we are looking for at the beginning is safety. So safety comes first all the time. So we need to make sure that the safety mechanisms are there. And after that, you would be looking at the additional elements. And with safety, with loss of human life, you have lots of legal issues. And that's why uh, things have the, to be put in place. The technology has to be proved that it's fully working for things to go forward. OK. I'll move on um, and discuss these different things. Um, and we can, we can go back to that in the afternoon if we have time. Okay, so this is the, the model that we had, so the, um, the Green Shield model. Uh, these are formulas for it. You don't have to know the formulas, but you can see that the shape is something like this. Y is equal to A plus BX, right? You have an A and B is the slope there, right? But you know that B it has to be negative, right? Because it's going down, that's why you have a negative here. And the values that we had at the end there, so VF, okay, VF is the free flow speed, and uh, rho J is the jam density, okay? So just put these values. So the equation that comes out, um, yeah, the equation that comes out is this. 
So Vf over rho j, please write this formula. You'll need it in the afternoon. OK? So the, re the speed, this is the speed versus density. So the first one. The speed versus the density is starting with the free flow speed, which is here, minus the free flow speed over the jam density. That's the ratio. That's the, uh, the slope that, is, that it is decre decreasing by. And again, Vf is the free flow speed. That's usually given. And rho j is the jam density. And that's the density, uh, the maximum density that you have. OK? So only the first one. OK. And then what you do, we know um, here uh, we're multiplying both sides by v and then multiplying by rho. And what we're achieving from there is we're getting the formula of q. So we're getting q versus rho. q versus rho um, is this one. So you have a squared here because it's a parabola. OK? Because q versus rho is a parabola, that's why we have the squared here. Um, so here's the green shield model again. Um, and now you're, you're going, you're trying to find out what these points are, this point and that point. OK, so you differentiate with respect to rho s, and you get these formulas. And this one, vo is vf over 2. It's half. OK? The, so the velocity that you have there is going to be half of the free flow velocity. And you get the same thing for rho 0. So rho 0, the one in the middle, is also rho j over 2. OK? And then when you multiply them together, uh, because k is equal, uh, q is equal to ku, you end up getting this. Please write also these two down. So the, the maximum flow that you can get through your system is um, the maximum density that you could have times the maximum um, velocity, so the, and the maximum speed, free flow velocity over 4. So at each point here, you're losing a ratio of 2. That's why you lose a ratio of 4 there. You, you can think about it in that way. Do you have questions about these? So again, the rho j is the jam density. It's the density here at the end. And that's the free flow speed. And q max is this value or the value on the other graph at the end. It's the same point. OK. Questions? If you, if you have questions about them, or if you need the formula in the afternoon, I can give it to you. OK. Um, OK, let's go back. Let's go back to this. What is a smart infrastructure? Smart infrastructure is an, oh, we said it's a mechanism through which you can adjust to changes in the environment. Uh, what you need for the, in order to achieve optimized performance, what you need for that is data from sensors, sending that information through communication systems. Uh, you need a central system that has a global view of what is happening in your network. Um, and then you, you come up with a decision, and that decision you have send it to a controller in order to improve the performance uh, when, when you implement that in your system. OK. So now, now that you've seen cloud computing, now that you've seen smart grids, um, and now that you know the basics of transportation, what you're going to work, be working on is what you need for smart transportation. Um, what are the, so you can work in the same groups. What are, let's see, what are the components that you need for smart transportation? Things are going to be a bit different now. I'll be going around asking you questions. If there are things that you don't know, I'll explain them. Um, but you're going to be drawing stuff now uh, more than yesterday. So what you need to do is have flowcharts, uh, have blocks, 
uh, showing the inputs and outputs that are coming out. Uh, so use block, block diagrams, functions of, and functions of each block. So um, the goal that you have, let's say, is to minimize congestion based on the fundamental diagrams. What do, what do we want to maximize, usually? In order to have efficient transportation system, what do we want to maximize? Flow. Um, another thing that we would want to uh, do based on the graph Maximize flow and then keep, sleep, uh, keep speed at a high uh, level. And at the same time, we want to be able to keep things in the uncongested state, right? So if there's congestion happening, then we want to push things into, into an uncongested state. So um, I will give you 30 minutes for this. Uh, I will go around and give different groups a different particular problem to solve, uh, a different intelligent transportation problem. Um, and I'll be asking you questions, what type of data you need, what do you need to do with that data, um, uh, where does it have to go, and what decision has to be made based on that in order to solve a problem. And some of these different, um, uh, different intelligent transportation systems, uh, we're going to ha be having activities on parameters related to them. Okay? So if you have bigger uh, notebooks, use them. Uh, remember, the most important part is having the blocks and having the inputs that are coming in and the outputs that are coming out. The inputs could include, for example, the road parameters that you're measuring on the road, and there are additional things that you need. Okay, any questions before you start? Okay, you have 30 minutes, and then we're going to uh, discuss what you came up with. So you've worked on different problems. There were people working on ramp metering, uh, ITS solution. Um, there were a couple of groups. Um, they're working on multimodal transportation, including coming up with uh, the emissions and the cost of transportation using different modes. Um, and you were working on how to measure travel times that would be posted on a variable message sign. Uh, some of these things we'll be seeing in uh, I'll be covering in the slides, actually, and some of them will have them um, in, in parameters with the activities uh, tomorrow. Let's go back to um, why we have these different issues in ITS, what are the different blocks that we need, and highlight some of the things that, um, some of the applications that are, are useful. So what is the problem in transportation? What are we trying to do in transportation? What is a transportation network used for? Sorry? The flow, of cars. flow of cars. So you want to flow uh, people, right? And you want to flow um, equipment and goods and things like that through, right? The food that you're buying is being is arriving from somewhere. I know some of the fruit and vegetables come from California, come from Chile, Mexico, so on and so forth. So those are all transported here, and transportation uh, inc includes. Um, the, and the cost of what we are paying for goods, uh, a big chunk of it is transportation. Okay. Um, so the requirements that we have is we want to move these bundles of people um, with the time varying demand, of course, uh, similar to cloud computing, as we mentioned. And we have a limited capacity of our roads. And um, we might also have variations in the supply. It's not just that our demand is varied, our supply might also be varied because if we have accidents or incidents on the road or we have uh, severe weather conditions, our supply actually decreases. I can't have the same flow that I uh, can have when nothing's wrong with the system, right? Um, the other element is human factors. Humans do not all do what... Um, a traffic engineer would want them to do. Uh, some humans drive far slower than they're supposed to or far faster than they're supposed to. Um, and as we said before, with increasing densities, uh, people want to be safe. That's why they drive slower to keep the, uh, the distance between them and, and the vehicles ahead of them. And all of those corp uh, are challenges within transportation. Um, 
the other element is we want to maximize the mobility, so we want to increase the efficiency of the road. Um, and we have side effects of uh, pollution. So we want to, at the same time, not have so many emissions. That's why, um, for example, uh, you hear about the use the, the using public transit more because we reduce the emissions of the road, or you have uh, dedicated bike lanes that would that have no emissions basically. And the last one is also uh, having reasonable mobility. So with the changes in uh, in the demand, you want to be able to actually keep people uh, and vehicles flowing through your system. That's what we're referring to as reasonable level of service. Okay, where is the delay coming from? Okay, so when we talk about this route took me 10 minutes longer than what I expected, where is this de delay cover uh, coming from? So we're talking about the conveyor belt problem there, and there, the capacity remains as a, as a maximum, right? So when I keep on adding density, this will plateau, you'll have a, a straight line towards the end. However, because people slow down, what happens in transportation networks is the flow would go down with the increasing density. Um, let's see. So there are delays having to do uh, with delay to enter the system, so on ramp. To enter it, you have to be uh, slower at the beginning than you have to speed up. Uh, you're going to slow down other people that are on the highway. Um, further delay due to system break and breakdown. So if you have congestion, congestion is also going to lead to you having to stop. Um, and we already explained the conveyor about the problem. And there are different rights of way at intersection that causes also delays and um, incidents which lead to decreases in supply or capacity. Okay. Uh, there are different things that are needed. One is long-term planning of where to build additional roads. Short-term uh, planning is the operations, how to change the traffic lights in order to meet uh, the flows that we have on our system. And the new trends are in intelligent transportation systems. So uh, monitoring what is happening across the network and detecting faults right away, uh, figuring out where there's congestion happening and trying to prevent it, figuring out where an accident is and sending uh, personnel to solve that problem and remove uh, the congestion due to, due to that. Um, estimation regulation and uh, uh, re uh, continuous estimation regulation uh, and or optimal control, so systems and software. How do you optimize your system? How do you change the control mechanisms? We were talking earlier about ramp metering uh, with one of the groups. And um, optimal control also includes, for example, traffic lights. Um, and the additional elements that you start talking about here is high bandwidth, high speed wireless and wireless communications. So we're talking about how uh, in cloud computing, it's faster to go uh, through Ethernet in order to get your data than to actually go to your own system to get the data that you had stored. Um, then we talked about smart infrastructure and how it's really important to have the communications to, uh, to get that data across uh, with low latency. And, and the additional element in power grids was all the, uh, um, the communication that is required to figure out exactly what is happening with the demand in different places in order to supply the required amount of energy rather than uh, over provision for the energy that I need to provide. Here also, all of the data that's starting to come out from different uh, vehicles, from different sensors uh, across uh, the city and um, the country, you need this information coming in and you need it to come in fast. And the last part is the automation, so drivers, uh, driverless cars, so those are also the new challenges uh, that would change how transportation networks would work. Okay, what is ITS? I is for intelligent. ITS is a, um, so intelligent transportation systems, and there are other definitions also. ITS is a set of technologies applied to transportation systems in order to achieve um, basically safer and more efficient uh, roads, and a lot of this has to do with uh, electronic technology, so you have the devices, you have the sensors, the additional sensors that you need, you have the communication technologies that you need them, 
in order to use this in order to provide uh, better systems uh, and with varying demand and changes in your environment. Um, so ITS is dealing with um, getting, let's see, the collection, processing, and the use of distribution of goods and people in order to achieve these goals. So it includes information technology, it includes communication technology, vehicles, roads, and operation centers. So the information that's going, it's going to be going to operation centers. They're going to come up by themselves or by through uh, the computers with optimal decisions, uh, optimal control mechanisms of how to, uh, what to change in your controllers to make things better. Okay, why do you need this? Why do you need the uh, ITS? One reason is a congested city. A congested city such as here is similar to an in intensive care unit patient. Um, and the reason is you have to solve it immediately. If you leave things for later, things are going to get worse. Okay? Uh, if there's congestion ahead, if it's not being solved, uh, then the congestion is going to extend. You're going to have a shockwave going uh, backwards, and more people are going to be delayed uh, after that. Um, and you can see some examples of that actually through Peronics. Okay. So let's go now to some of the um, different functionalities and different blocks that you need. So let's see. The control objective that, so this is a loop. I can start from anywhere. Let's start from here. So you have, you have your transportation system network or virtual model of the system. So you have your actual system. You do the measurements from there. Um, you put it in your systems. You try to estimate the actual demands. That's why in Pyramix, there's the uh, demand matrix where you see where people are going from which location to which location. So that's the travel demand. And then you start monitoring. So you have the loop detectors, which we mentioned uh, measures uh, the road parameters. And then you have CCTV cameras and GPS mobility traces from the actual vehicles. So through communication mechanism, that goes to different blocks for detection, estimation, forecasting. So uh, why, where would we need detection? Can someone give me an example of where do we need detection? Detection of something happening on the road. Give me an example of something that we need to detect. The yeah. speed of, the speed of cars. Cr crash. So speed would come into estimation. I'll, I'll talk about that in a minute. A, a, a crash. If uh, one way of measuring uh, if there is an incident on the road is uh, if you have multiple uh, loop detectors and you can monitor the different flows that you have, and everything is flowing fine, and all of a sudden things are going down the speeds are going down like tremendously. You know there is a problem there. So you can send emergency personnel there in order to solve the problem. Um, that's for detection. And uh, detection get, gets a bit difficult when you have uh, anomalies in your system and you need to make sure to filter them out. Why? Because you might have someone uh, just driving slowly or they have stopped on the road. There's no accident. They stopped. They want a coffee. So you need to make sure that you take those people out of your system and you're not sending emergency personnel when they're not needed. Um, estimation. So estimating um, speed is, an, is another element. So you're measuring these things and you need to estimate what the speeds are like. Uh, if they are averages, and they're going to be over a, a, a period of time. And you need to make sure that uh, they're accurate. And you're, again, removing uh, people that are not supposed to be in that measurement and forecasting. So forecasting, um, with the two groups here, we're talking about ITS technologies to uh, come up with travel times, to post them on a variable message sign. And uh, one of the things now that you have is you do that measurement, then you post the travel time saying uh, from college, um, well, let's say from Dundas to Bloor, uh, you have five minutes through uh, Beverly or St. George. Uh, seven minutes through university and um, eight minutes through Spadina, then you have that information you, uh, which, is, which has been calculated based on vehicles that passed by 
uh, like a few minutes ago, you post that, but that's not valid anymore. If it has gone for, let's say, more than 10 minutes, uh, it might not be valid anymore. It might be historic data rather than actual current data. So um, people are looking at how to use forecasting and prediction of what is going to happen and incorporating that in your measurements. Then you go, you take the outcomes of these blocks and you put them into a control objective. So control systems and decision support. Here you have your, uh, all of these coming in. You have um, your, your topology, the geometry of your system, and you're trying to achieve different things. So real-time control, for example, adaptive sig signal control. You want to change the, uh, the signal control or the traffic controls uh, in your city. Ramp metering, you want to adjust how often you're letting vehicles onto your system in order to keep the flow downstream high. And at the same time, you don't want people to wait a lot on the, on the ramp. Um, we're going to talk about ATIS, divergence guidance, so guiding vehicles and where they need to go. Uh, so that's what we're trying to achieve, usually a control objective. And what do we do when we come up with that? We send it back to where it needs to show or it needs to change a particular parameter. So we, through communication again, communication here, communication there, we send it through the field for deployment. Um, and then it gets implemented in the system. A lot of this um, sometimes is calculated and then someone has to go and connect and download it to a traffic light if it's pre-timed you're changing the cycles, but a lot of it now is going towards being real time, adjusting to changes faster, um, and that's where, you, uh, as, we, as we have learned, you'll be able to have even better performance. Okay, a project uh, that we're working on, this is um, a, uh, with four professors, my supervisor is one of the professors, uh, we, there's another professor from so my supervisor, Professor Alberto Leon Garcia, from uh, with a networking background, or in, or in electrical engineering, electronic computer engineering. Uh, we have Professor Abdel Hai in civil engineering and transportation, intelligent transportation systems. Uh, we have a Professor uh, Jacobson in the computer group who deals with uh, middleware, and basically he deals with cars as if they're sensors and what do you do with the data that's coming. And we have Pro Professor Litoyo in York University that deals with control systems. What are the best control systems? Um, and how do you scale up and down your systems in order to adjust to what's happened? So the way we're looking at things in this project is you have a massive amount of data that is coming um, from your transportation system. And that is uh, needed in order to come up with uh, new applications and improve transportation. So you have data coming from your road sensors. You have data that is coming from vehicles. So with uh, a lot of it with 4G, some of it with vehicle-to-vehicle uh, -vehicle communication mechanisms. Um, you have uh, information, um, information such as like weather conditions or where events are uh, that are coming from your, uh, from your computers, uh, from your servers. And these nodes would be able to interact through um, this content-based routing mechanism in the middle. So this is part of our architecture in the middle. And in here, uh, what you want to do is uh, the information that comes out, the data that comes out, you need to route it. You need to send that information to whoever requires it. So if a, uh, if a vehicle here is interested uh, in information from servers and in, in traffic information and so on and so forth, it can put in a request send me information if traffic delay is, is more than five seconds on this road during this time. Only if there's a match for all of those, that is when the routing mechanism um, uh, has, there's a match in the routing mechanism and that information is sent to that vehicle. Now, this information would be used on, um, when it's gathered and filtered, as we mentioned in the previous slide, by, uh, by public uh, application providers for ITS services, so um, it could be used, for example, for VMS services and uh, guiding people where they're supposed to go. And it could also help private application uh, providers with travel assistance, personalized routing. So when you're on the road, it might uh, be giving a dynamic uh, routing mechanism saying, actually, uh, the route that I gave you five minutes ago, it's, it's not good anymore. Why don't you change it? 
Um, it's, it's not uh, as common today. And the other element is fleet management, where a company is trying to make sure uh, um, that their truck drivers are not stopping somewhere that they're actually driving and um, trying to figure out where their devices, uh, where their uh, vehicles uh, are. Um, any questions about this? Yes, what we're aiming for is having a mechanism, having a platform in the middle where um, people could uh, provide uh, different information, so different sensor information and vehicle information will be feeding in. And you need to have uh, the middle part, the middleware part is the actual important element, is how do you do the routing for that? Uh, because different people are looking for different particular data. You're not interested in a road segment that you passed two minutes ago, right? So the routing has to be very accurate to be for a particular section, particular time, uh, with particular conditions. I don't want to be receiving an alert uh, that I already know, right? If I received something 10 minutes ago, the system should know that it shouldn't send me that information. And all of the communication that is happening in between it's costing money, so you want to also minimize it. Okay. Um, concept central to ITS. Um, you want to gather information in a timely manner. Um, there, there are different benefits for drivers, for system owners, and for the uh, transportation system as a whole. Um, you want a unifying architecture to which uh, people can send their information. Um, and ITS actually is a multidisciplinary uh, work. That's why I'm an electrical engineer uh, or a computer engineer working in this field. And there are different people from different backgrounds um, using their expertise in order to make ITS work. So general benefits of ITS, here you can see congested networks, uh, reduced travel time, less congestion, uh, better utilization of the network, so increased throughput throughput and better traffic distribution, uh, enhanced safety and convenience, and perception, reduce energy consumption, less pollution. Okay, um, I will leave these to the, for the afternoon. There are different, um, there are, I have like 10 different slides for different intelligent transportation system mechanisms. Um, okay, I will see you at one. Please you have your notebooks with you. You have activities where you need to solve stuff on your notebooks in that way.